So first we will talk about uh, schistocytes. Uh, please let me know if I'm going too fast now. Huh? Yeah, so schistocytes, again, they're smaller cells. By definition, they are smaller. They don't have any central payload and they have sharp angulated edges or spines and variable shapes and sizes, okay? So uh, basically they are fragmented RBC. So that's why the shapes can be highly irregular. Mostly they have sharp edges and spines. So sometimes they can have round contour also like microspherocytes, but consider them microspherocytes and schistocytes only when the other cells are also present, the abnormal shapes. So various names have been given to these uh, shapes like triangular cell, helmet cell, comet cell, but these are not, no need to describe them as separate kind of uh, cells and just to confuse the clinician, just call them uh, schistocytes. Why? Because they represent the same clinical process. They have claimed same clinical significance. So there is no need to describe them separately. Okay, you are seeing triangular cell, helmet cell. This will just increase the length of the, uh, your PVF that you are writing and it will make no, no difference to the clinician or might even confuse them. So just write them as just the site and get done with it. They should not be more than 0.2% in healthy adults, but uh, normally we don't see schistocytes uh, in the uh, pedicure guards. So they should not be more than 0.2% in healthy adults, but they can be seen up to 1% in term neonates and up to 5% in preterm neonates. Just keep this in mind because once I have, without knowing that the neonate was term or preterm, and I actually mentioned hemolysis in the in neonate and found out later that it was a preterm neonate. So just, just re remember that when you are seeing uh, increased number of sisters, I just try to inquire about their history a bit, whether it's a preterm unit, then in that case, up to 5% cystocytes is also considered normal. Yeah, so schistocytes are seen, they can be seen in genetic disorders like thalassemias, congenital dyserythropoietic anemias, hereditary pyrophoid kilocytosis, or acquired disorders of RBC formation like megaloblastic anemia, dyserythropoietic anemias, or mechanical stress like uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemias, and direct thermal injuries like burns. So these are the various causes where you can find schistocytes in the blood. So like I said, just focus on the causes when you find the certain cells, just look for the causes because all of these have some additional abnormalities. So once you are seeing one type of cell, just try finding another type of cells that are seen in that condition. And on that basis of that, you will be able to make a diagnosis on that smear. Yeah. So it is very important to remember they can be seen in megaloblastic anemia. Don't, don't call it a hemolytic anemia when you are seeing uh, macrovelocytes and hypersegmented neutrophils and whatnot, all the cases of megaloblastic anemia, and then you are finding some schistocytes, don't call it a case of hemolytic anemia. It's just a finding in megaloblastic anemia, yes. And there are certain specific type of uh, these schistocytes which have been found, like microspherocytes are found in cases of burns. In the linear fragments, I'll just show an image, they are found in the cases of sickle cell anemia. So, yeah. So these are different kind of uh, schistocytes. Here in the first image, you are seeing these irregular shaped and spines and all these, uh, these this kind of schistocytes. In the second image, you are seeing one triangular shape. This, this one in the corner is a helmet shaped cell. So another triangular cell. These are, you are finding microspherocytes here. Here you are seeing one irregularly contacted cells. So uh, all these things, you have to call them schistocytes only. Don't call them by different names, okay? So again, here you are seeing these microspherocytes. You can see the size, shapes are variable and the size is pretty small. So these are microspherocytes. This was from a case of burn, yes. And this is the another uh, special type of schistocyte talk, I talked about, that is the linear fragment you are seeing. So uh, in case of uh, sickle cell anemia, you will find this kind of um, schistocyte. So this is a schistocyte, not a sickle cell. I'll be showing the sickle cell image in the, Next uh, few slides, yes. So there are certain uh, guidelines. Uh, this is an article from 2021 that is uh, IUCSS, that is International Council for Standardization in Hematology, recommendation for identification, diagnostic value, and quantitation of cystocytes. So in 2012, they gave some recommendation, and in 2021, they just saw the, their impact, what was the impact, and if the changes were needed. So if you guys want, you can just text me. I will share this article. It's a nice article. You can read it up. 
but uh, I will just quickly cover the important findings which are given in that, this article. Yes. So these guidelines mostly they are given for the recognition and enumeration of cystocytes in suspected cases of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and HUS. Just remember in these cases, the percentage of cystocytes, it's very important that they help in making the diagnosis of these conditions. So these guidelines have been specifically uh, designed for these two conditions, but they are being used for any condition associated with cystocytosis, yes. So one thing is they are always smaller than intact RBC cystocytes. How, when, when do you call a cell a cystocyte? Okay, they are always smaller than intact RBC. They are homogeneously stained and they include fragments with sharp angles and straight borders. Okay, like small crescents, helmet cells, keratocytes and microspherocytes. Just remember about microspherocytes, like I said previously also, they are considered cystocytes only when the other characteristic cells like these crescents, helmet and keratocytes, when they are present, only then you call them, uh, count them as cystocytes. Otherwise, please don't count them as cystocytes. The second point is you have to uh, count 1000 erythrocytes to reach a percentage. And more than 1% of cystocytes is considered significant for these entities. But to reach that 1%, count at least 1000 erythrocytes either at 40x or 100x, whichever power you are convenient, uh, that is convenient for you, you are comfortable with, just count at that. And the quantification is only relevant when cystocytosis is dominant morphological abnormality. I will just go back to that uh, megaloblastic anemia example with this. In megaloblastic anemia, you are finding macrocytes, macrovellocytes, and uh, other findings, okay? But their cystocytosis, it, cystocytes is not the dominant morphological abnormality. So you don't quantify. You, the quantification, if you do it there, it's not relevant, okay? So when cystocytosis is dominant abnormality, then only this quantification is relevant, okay? So, and again, there is one more important thing that smears that should be made within three hours when the sample is stored at room temperature and within eight hours when the sample is stored at four degrees Celsius. So the thing is when the samples are stored for longer, they will start showing the shape abnormalities like we talked about the storage artifact and all in our previous lectures. So they will start showing these abnormalities. So that's why it is very important that if you are getting a case of a suspected IDP or TTP or HUS, try to make slides within three hours when they are stored at room temperature as early as possible. That is what I would say. And that is that stands true for both the peripheral blood film as well as see there are many analyzers available these days, which actually give you the fragmented RBC count that is called FRC. So they actually give you that count. But in that case also, you need to have the uh, process the sample as soon as possible because this artifact will be induced in the auto analyzer also if the sample is kept for too long. 